Murphy's fourpenny lunch was a ritual vitiated by no base thoughts of nutrition. He advanced along the railings by easy stages until he came to a branch of the caterers he wanted. The sensation of the seat of a chair coming together with his drooping posteriors at last was so delicious that he rose at once and repeated the sit lingeringly and with intense concentration. Murphy did not so often meet with these tendernesses that he could afford to treat them casually. The second sit, however, was a great disappointment. The waitress stood before <clears throat> with an air of such abstraction that he didn't feel entitled to regard himself as an element in her situation. At last, seeing that she did not move, he said, Bring me... In the voice of an usher, resolved to order the chef's special selection for a school outing. He paused after this preparatory signal to let the four period develop. That first of three moments of reaction in which, according to the Culp School, the major torments of response are undergone. Then he applied the stimulus proper. A cup of tea and a packet of assorted biscuits. Tuppence the tea, tuppence the biscuits, a perfectly balanced meal. As though suddenly aware of the great magical ability, or it might have been the surgical quality, the waitress murmured before the eddies of the main period drifted her away, Vera to you, dear. This was not a caress. Vera concluded, as she thought, her performance in much better style than she'd begun. It was hard to believe as she set down the tray that it was the same slavey. She actually made out the bill there and then on her own initiative. Murphy pushed the tray away tilted back his chair and considered his lunch with reverence and satisfaction. With reverence because, as an adherent on and off to the extreme theophanism of William of Champeau, he could not but feel humble before such sacrifices to his small but implacable appetite, nor omits the silent grace on this part of himself that I am about to ingest, may the Lord have mercy. With satisfaction, because the supreme moment in his degradations had come, the moment when, unaided and alone, he defrauded a vested interest. The sum involved was small, something between a penny and tuppence on the retail valuation, but then he had only fourpence worth of confidence to play with. His attitude simply was that if a swindle of from 25 to 50% of the outlay and effected while you wait was not a case of the large returns and quick turnover indicated by Souk, then there was a serious flaw somewhere in his theory of sharp practice. But no matter how the transaction were judged from the economic point of view, nothing could detract from its merit as a little triumph of tactics in the face of the most fearful odds only compare the belligerents. On the one hand, a colossal league of plutomanic caterers highly endowed with the ruthless cunning of the sane, having at their disposal all the most deadly weapons of the post-war recovery. On the other, a seedy solipsist and fourpence. The seedy solipsist then, having said his silent grace and savoured his infamy in advance, drew up his chair briskly to the table, seized the cup of tea and half emptied it at one gulp. No sooner had this gone to the right place than he began to splutter, eructate and complain as though he had been duped into swallowing a saturated solution of powdered glass. In this way, he attracted to himself the attention not only of every customer in the saloon, but actually of the waitress Vera who came running to get a good view of the accident, as she supposed. Murphy continued for a little to make sounds as of a flushing box taxed beyond its powers, and then said in an egg and scorpion voice, I ask for China, and you give me Indian. Though disappointed that it was nothing more interesting, Vera made no bones about making good her mistake. She was a willing little bit of sweated labour, incapable of betraying the slogan of her slavers, that since the customer or sucker was paying for his gut rot ten times what it cost to produce, and five times what it cost to fling in his face, it was only reasonable to defer to his complaints up to, but not exceeding, 50% of his exploitation. With the fresh cup of tea, Murphy adopted quite a new technique. He drank not more than a third of it, and then waited till Vera happened to be passing. I'm most fearfully sorry, 
he said, Vera, to give you this trouble. But do you think it would be possible to have this filled with hot? Vera, showing signs of bridling, Murphy uttered winningly the sesame, I know I'm a great nuisance, but they have been too generous with the cow juice. Generous and cow juice were the key words here. No waitress could hold out against their mingled overtones of gratitude and mammary organs. And Vera was essentially a waitress. But that is the end of how Murphy defrauded a vested interest every day for his lunch to the honourable extent of paying for one cup of tea and consuming 1.83 cups, approximately. Try it sometime, gentle skimmer. <laughs>